I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Okay, now it's really started. Um, so my name is Jack Hickmott and I'll start with a little bit of housekeeping and then I'll introduce our speaker for the day. So hello and welcome to the Institute for Molecular Science and Engineering's webinar, Development of the Bacteria Viruses, Bacteriophage into a Delivery Technology for Therapeutic Nucleic Acids Against Cancer and Other Human Diseases, presented by Professor Amin Ajito, a professor of targeted therapeutics in the Department of Brain Sciences at Imperial College London. This webinar is part of the molecular level understanding is crucial for targeted uh, drug delivery in the brain webinar series. I am Dr. Jack Hickmont, a research associate at the National Heart and Lung Institute at Imperial College London. We'll be putting some helpful links into the chat function, um, including links to the IMSE invite Eventbrite page where you can find the registration for all our upcoming webinars, the IMSE YouTube channel where you can view all of our previous webinars, um, our IMSE blog, the Never Lick the Spoon podcast, all our previous briefing papers, and registration to our newsletter so that you can keep up to date with all of our IMSE news and events. Um, so just a couple of top tips to make sure that we can have a great webinar today. Please make sure that your microphone and video are switched off. If you wish to ask a question, please put your question in the Q&A function at any time during the webinar and I'll read them out during the Q&A session. Um, if you have any te technical difficulties, please message IMSE Imperial privately and a member of the IMSE team will try and help you where possible. Uh, and now to move on to introducing today's speaker, Professor Amin Ajito. Um, Amin Ajito completed his PhD at the University of Liege in Belgium. During his PhD, he, worked, he uh, acquired extensive experience in gene delivery technologies using eukaryotic viral vectors. Then he completed his postdoctoral training at the world leading MD Anderson Cancer, Cancer Center in Texas, which is in the USA, uh, where he gained expertise in bacteriophage, guided gene delivery and phage display technologies in vitro and in vivo. Importantly, he designed a novel hybrid phage vector for targeted gene transfer. The hybrid phage showed first success of systemic gene transfer to cancer in vivo. His team and independent groups reported efficacy in intravenous cancer gene therapy in rodents and pet dogs with natural cancers. Then in 2008, Agito established his research team as a lecturer at Imperial College London, where he became a senior lecturer in 2013, then reader in 2016, and professor of targeted therapeutics in 2019. His research team has become a leading authority in phage-guided gene delivery technologies, focusing on optimization and development of superior phage-derived vectors for nucleic acid delivery to human diseases, including DNA vaccines. His leadership in the field has resulted in various awards for his research, numerous high-profile publications, and more than six patent applications, with the most already granted in the U United States of America. His patents have contributed to the creation of two startup companies in the USA. He is also a scientific co-founder of a spin-off company at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, so I think at this point, we've got an excellent program for you today, so I will keep going on and I'll pass it on to Professor um, Agito to take us through his um, research in bacteriophage technologies. Thank you very much, Jack, for the, the nice introduction and thank you all for the invitation. It's, it's a really great pleasure to present in your institute. We used to have a joint event for the early career research with your institute here, but it's nice really to present an overview of our work. So today, as I said, just an overview of what we have done to develop these bacteria viruses, phage or bacteriophages that were used to, that have been used actually to treat bacterial infections, how, how, what we did to turn them into vectors to target systemic delivery of nucleic acids. We mainly targeted cancer. Now we, target, we are targeting other diseases using them in TNA vaccine, but I will show examples of cancer, including brain tumors. Just one example of brain tumors, glioblastoma, which are uh, deadly brain tumors. So what we have done since 2009, when we, we published on my doc, on my doc study that actually increased our, our, our visibility. Uh, so I'm trying to see, okay. So just an introduction about gene therapy. So, there is no, no question that successful delivery of nucleic acids or just gene delivery to the diseased site would present a major advance in the practice of medicine in the treatment of human diseases. Actually, gene delivery is an alternative to therapy, to, to, to the delivery of proteins 
and peptides, therapeutic proteins and peptides have been a promising approach to treat various human diseases. They have been used in hormonal therapy, in vaccines, in cytotoxic peptides and proteins, in cytokine therapy, in cancer immunotherapy, and, and as antibodies. But therapy with peptides and proteins have had some limitations because of their stability, the short half-life, and the side effects because they are not selective. One solution is to use gene delivery to produce these uh, proteins. But gene delivery was mainly has been mainly used in gene therapy. And gene delivery or gene therapy was actually initially designed to treat inherited diseases, genetic disease. But now the scope of gene therapy, let's just call it gene therapy or gene delivery, gene therapy has increased to treat various human diseases, including arthritis, infectious diseases. But the majority of, of clinical trials now are designed to treat cancer because cancer is a major core cause of mortality in the world. And malignant brain tumors or glioblastoma was the first disease to be treated in the clinic by gene therapy, which failed at that time. Failed at the time because of the vectors. To deliver nucleic acid, you, you need a vector because initially we tried, uh, uh, clinicians and scientists tried to deliver genes directly in the human body, but they get taken up by uh, by positively charged proteins because DNA nucleic acids are negatively charged. They also get degraded by nuclease. So you need a vector to protect your DNA or RNA to deliver. That's why we use vectors. So the problem at the time was the vectors. In this slide, I'm just trying to show the standard, I mean, the existing vectors that have been mainly, mainly used in the clinic, cationic polymers because they are positively charged nucleic acids are negatively charged, so they form complexes. And the membrane cells, the membrane of our cells are negatively charged through so these complexes. They can get attracted to the cells and deliver the nucleic acids. Liposomes have also been used because they have a lipidic sphere, so membrane that mimics the membrane of our cells. So they can fuse with our cells and deliver the DNA. The, the, the load and viruses, human viruses have been mainly used because they can deliver therapeutic genes as part of the infectious process. So this slide shows examples of uh, human viruses that have been mainly used, retroviruses and lontiviruses. These are integrating viruses, but the problem with these viruses in the past, they can activate proto-oncogenes because they can get integrated upstream proto-oncogene, so they activate them, causing cancer and death of children. Then they decided to turn adenoviruses into vectors because they don't get integrated. But the problem with adenoviruses, they are highly inflammatory, which caused the death in late 90s of uh, that child, G.C. Gilsinger. They tried when he was treated for a hepatic disease, genetic disease, but he died. And then herpes simplex viruses have been used to generate vectors because they can get into the brain. But now adenoviral, adeno-associated viruses are mainly used to generate vectors because they are not pathogenic. They are not pathogenic and they have a huge success. They have been successfully used in some clinical trials. But to make vectors from these viruses, it's the same principle. What you need to do, you just need to make them replication deficient. For instance, this is what you do, you extract the genome. This is the genome of the adeno-associated virus. You need to take out, to take out the, the main genes, rep and cap, rep for the replication of the genome and cap for the production of the capsid. You need to take them out and to replace them with mammalian transgene cassette. That's how do you make the vector. Mammalian transgene cassette is a promoter and uh, the promoter of the cytomegalovirus has been mainly used to express that's for transcription because this promoter is active in, in most human tissues. Then your DNA sequence, your sequence of, could be your sequence of interest, and then a poly A to stop the transcription. That's the mammalian transgene cassette. But we keep the ATRs. Inverted terminal repeats because they are involved into the, because this is a single-stranded genome, so they are involved in the conversion to 
double strand genome, which is important to allow transcription and into the packaging into the capsid. That's the main principle we use to make vectors for these, from these human viruses. Okay, now gene therapy has been around for a long time since the 60s, but it has not delivered the, the expected outcome. Why? Because gene therapy has faced major problems, mainly systemic gene therapy, mainly systemic gene therapy. Successful, system, successful gene therapy requires a successful systemic gene delivery, not local. Local gene delivery can be used to show some efficacy or proof of concept, but real clinical, clinical benefit can only happen with systemic delivery. I mean, intravenous, oral, intradermal. I mean, a system that allows, allows the, the, the gene expression everywhere in the body. For instance, cancer, the majority of cancer patients, 90% they die because of metastasis. I mean, to treat metastasis, you cannot use a local delivery. You need a systemic administration. That's why they use chemotherapy. Systemic chemotherapy. I'm just giving you the example of this mouse. That's an experiment I did when I was a PhD student. I generate, I induced, I established a tumor here in a mouse. You can see here. Then I generated another viral vector delivering the luciferase gene. And then I used imaging to track the expression of luciferase by the adenoviral vector. That's a systemic administration. It's an intravenous administration through the tail vein. You can see that the adenoviral vector generated expression in the liver, in the kidneys, everywhere, even at the site of injection, but minimal expression in the tumor. So if you deliver a cytotoxic gene, you kill this mouse. So one solution is to target. We tried to target them, but we, what we had to do was first to ablate, to take out the native tropism, and then to redirect, to redirect them to a new receptor in cancer. That was not successful. That was not successful. But another problem we had to face at the time in late 90s when I was trying to repeat the administration, I mean immunogenicity, because the first administration generates neutralizing antibodies. If you want to go with the second and third injection, it doesn't, it doesn't work actually. It becomes even toxic. And then the AAV. AAV vectors are popular in the clinic, but they have one major limitation, which is the chlorine capacity. They cannot accommodate more than four point, more than four and a half KB. And then, of course, they are expensive, the production to good manufacturing process to inject to patients and scaling up the production. That's what has been experienced with COVID vaccines, and the distribution, all that. So what we decided to do was when, 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 I, when I was doing my postdoctoral training, I turned to bacteriophages because I was working in a phage display technology lab. I was a gene therapist at that time. Then I decided to use bacteriophages or phages, these are bacteria, viruses. They don't infect a human, they don't infect plant cells. And that's what attracted me to use them. Because if you, it means if you deliver them systemically, they shouldn't infect human tissues. They shouldn't infect healthy tissues. So they were discovered in 1896. And in 1915, they found out that these phages, they kill the bacteria. They are the most abundant organisms on earth. Because of their antibacterial activity, they were used before the discovery of antibiotics to treat bacterial infections in the human. Then they were discarded after the discovery of penicillin. But then some East European countries continued to use them. But now in the West, the, the, the interest in bacteriophage is, is growing in the West and they have entered clinical trials like the, this story published in Nature Medicine in 2019, where this girl, 15-year-old girl, she, she is a cystic fibrosis patient. Patients with cystic fibrosis, they have uh, infections in the lung. And when it's some mycobacterium, that's dangerous because they are resistant to antibiotics. So this girl was going to die. But when they treated her with a cocktail 
or bacteriophages, the bacteriophage cleared the infection and saved the life of this girl. On top of that, in 2006, the US Food and Drug Administration approved the, the use of phages as antibacterial food additives to prevent on ready to eat meat and poultry, here to prevent the growth of listeria, salmonella, and E. coli. The point I'm trying to take here is that they are safe. If you want to come up with a new technology to deliver nucleic acids, there are two crucial considerations, safety and efficacy. So they are safe. And we can deliver them systemically because they do not infect human tissues. Of course, they are cost-effective. We can produce them at GMP standard. But then how do you make a vector from a bacteria phage? Because the first thing to deliver the phage has to enter into human cells because it doesn't have any receptor. It doesn't have, you take bacteria phage, you mix with the human cells, it doesn't get inside. So we decided to, to modify the capsid, to make the capsid able to bind to receptors on human cells. We used the phage display technology, which was awarded the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2018 by George Smith, who, who is a collaborator. So what's the phage display technology? That's the M13 phage. It's a filamentous phage. Phage display technology is to modify the coat proteins, like here, the P3 minor coat proteins. The way is to display this ligand in red, which will allow the phage to bind to antibodies or to other receptors. So if the receptor is selective in a tissue or in cancer, in a disease, then the bacterial phage becomes targeted, becomes selective. So how do we do that? You extract the genome, and this is the, the gene for the coat protein. You cut the gene, you insert the DNA sequence that encodes for the ligand. Then you generate a fusion gene that will produce a recombinant protein, which will allow the phase to bind to a specific receptor. So this is what we did, actually. We used the filamentous bacteriophage here, and we displayed the cyclic RGD4C. Why? Because it binds to alpha-5 beta-3 integrin. This integrin is selectively expressed in cancer, on cancer cells and blood vessels in cancer. But it's minimally expressed on the healthy tissues because we want to target cancer. So then the bacteriophage can get, can enter into cancer cells, deliver the genome here. So when we inserted the C, which is mammalian transgene cassette, it was not that effective. It was not that effective. So then what we decided to do, we decided to insert the genome of AAV. Here, why AAV? Because both AAV and the genome of this phage M13 are single-stranded DNA. They are compatible to insert into each other. So we generated a hybrid genome of phage and AAV that gets packaged by the capsid of phage. So this cancer-targeted capsid of phage packages this hybrid genome in which there is AAV. There is, there is a, there. So there is, there is no AAV capsid. So we named it AAV phage or AAVP. So if you add this to cancer cells, if you don't have RGD, there is no binding to the integrin, to the receptor. There is no delivery. But if you have the RGD on the phage, the phage will bind to the integrin, deliver the hybrid genome in which there is an AAV that will deliver GFP as you can see. The same thing in vivo. That's a systemic administration through the tail vein. As you can see, the phase, the RGD, the AAV phase did not deliver lysiferase into the healthy tissue because, because there is no expression of the receptor in the healthy tissues. But the phase was able to deliver lysiferase expression into the tumors in a selective way. You take out the RGD, you lose the expression. You scramble the RGD or you use another peptide, which receptor is not expressed in the tumors. You don't get delivery to the tumors. The independent groups use our vector to deliver TNF alpha, for instance. I'm just gonna show this an example of repetition of our work. TNF alpha or tumor necrosis factor alpha is a strong cytokine. It kills tumor cells, it kills uh, any cells. 
he has strong anti tumor activity. But when he was taken to the clinic, he showed severe systemic toxicity. So he needs to be targeted. So this group decided to use our phage to target this gene to produce TNF alpha. This is what they did. And then when they injected this intravenously to mice here with human tumors, and then they harvested, after a few days, they harvested the tumors, the brain, muscle, heart, spleen, like kidney, liver. They quantified TNF alpha and they detected the high levels of TNF alpha in the tumors only without any TNF alpha produced into the healthy tissue. So that's a safe way to deliver TNF alpha. And then if you make sections in the tumors, this is a blood vessel in red, this is GFP. You find that GFP is expressed on the blood vessels and on tumor cells because both they express the receptor. Because this alpha-5, beta-3 receptor is expressed in growing tissues. The, the vasculature in tumors is a growing vasculature. And then if you deliver TNF-alpha, if you don't have RGD, the vector cannot deliver TNF-alpha to the tumors. But if you have the RGD, it's targeted, then the vector delivers TNF-alpha to the blood vessels and the tumor cells. So you blow up the blood vessels as well as the tumor cells. So it's a dual action. Again, here we deliver suicide gene therapy because suicide gene therapy was the first to be used in the clinic in 91 to treat glioblastoma brain tumors, but it didn't work. Suicide gene therapy is the delivery of thymidine kinase of the herpes virus. If you give gencyclovir, it gets, it gets phosphorylated by the TK, which kills the, the cells. So you call suicide gene therapy. So targeted intravenous delivery of suicide gene therapy completely stopped the growth of the tumors here in mice compared to controls treated with a non-targeted vector and in which the tumors grow very large. The same thing in rats. These rats had human soft tissue sarcoma, very aggressive tumors. If you give them intravenous injections of the non-targeted vector with the TK and the cyclovir, nothing happens, they grow very large. If you target, then you stop the growth of these tumors. And then the, the National Cancer Institute <clears throat> decided to treat dogs with cancer because the owner of these dogs, these are dying dogs actually. The owners, they go to the NCI looking for new treatment. So when you have a new drug to get to human clinical trials, you need to show efficacy in rodents. This is what we did. Then safety in larger animals. Then we decided to do this in, in these dogs. Actually, in the US, every year, 4 million dogs, they are diagnosed with cancer. So what the vets did, they did like phase one in human dose escalation to reach an MTD, maximally tolerated dose. But there was no MTD because phase is safe. And then they said, the vets, I was collaborating with them. They said, to save these dogs, we need to repeat the administrations. So they, they, they carried out safety of multiple injections and they found out that they are safe. And then when they collected the blood, there were antibodies against the face. But that, that was not a problem. And then what, what they did after two months, after several injections, they looked at the tissues to see whether these antibodies, they don't block the face, as it happens with human viruses. And then when they took biopsies, they found here in red, the phage in the tumors after several injections but no phage was detected in the healthy tissues, in the lungs, intestine, liver, or spleen. And then the selective accumulation of the phage in the tumors after several injections, despite the presence of antibodies against the phage capsid, resulted in the production of TNF alpha in the tumors without any TNF alpha in the healthy tissues. So they decided to save the dogs with the repeated injections. Just gonna give the example of this dog. This dog had a huge fibrosarcoma, 15 centimeter tumor. This dog was dying. So they treated the dog with four injections, IV injections once a week. After four weeks, the tumor was shrinking. And then after a total of two of eight weeks, eight injections, the, tum the, tumors, the tumor was completely eradicated. Even histopathological analysis of the remaining lesion did not show any viable tumor. So we saved a few dogs. 
and they lived for a few years. Then what happened at the time in 2013, a company was launched. They took the vector TNF alpha, RGD, AAVP, TNF alpha. I think they started the clinical trials. I am inventor in that company, but we don't use this vector anymore, actually. So I will tell you why now, because we generated new strategies based on that technology. So I will show, then I will tell you what we have done since 2009. Uh, but I would like to start with this slide. The slide shows different steps of delivery of nucleic acids. Your vector to deliver nucleic acids to the cells first has to diffuse through the extracellular matrix to find its receptor on the cell surface. Then when the vector binds to the receptor, it gets internalized into, for the viruses, the endosomes into these vesicles. It depends on the size, bacteria is in the phagosomes. So then, then the vector has to escape from the endosome. If it doesn't escape, these endosomes become lysosomes and they will be degraded, but they escape. So when they are in the cytoplasm, then they get transported to the nucleus with gen, with gene expression occurs. So human viruses have developed strategies to get through all these steps. What about bacteriophage? Because it has evolved to infect bacteria only. So when we used FLIR recently labeled bacteriophage, then when we mix it with the extracellular matrix of tumors, that's the diffusion. If we use, when we use collagenase hyaluronidase to reduce the extracellular matrix concentration, we had better diffusion because the extracellular, the outside of tumor cells is rich in extracellular matrix. So it's a problem. The diffusion is a problem for our face. When we look at, at the binding to the cell surface, the face is negatively charged. The cell membrane, the membrane of our cells are negatively charged. There is a repulsion. So what we did, we mixed it with cationic polymer, polymers to generate positively charged phage, which had better attachment and better gene delivery. And then we looked inside the cells. So we looked at the diffusion, the binding to the cells, and inside the cells. This is electronic microscopic imaging showing the phage 10 minutes on the cell surface, then in the early endosomes, the multivesicular bodies, and the lysosomes. The phage doesn't escape from the endosomes. The majority of phage and stuff in the lysosomes gets degraded. We lost, we lost, we have lost the phage in the lysosomes. You give them chloroquine, which blows up the endosomes, then you get a better gene delivery because then the phage can escape. But chloroquine can, give, can be given to patients, but we don't want to use chloroquine. So what we did, we, we, have, we have generated a bacteriophage here. Uh, if you look at our bacteriophage, that's the RGD on the P3 minor code proteins. So what we decided to do, to use strategies used, used by human viruses to escape from the endosomes by displaying these peptides, endosomal escape peptides on the major code protein, which was a problem because it affected the production because this, some of them are large peptides. So then we generated a phase that has an, an additional major code protein on which we could display endosomal escape peptides from human viruses. And when we screened them, and then this H5, is it enriched peptide from the human influenza virus used by the human flu virus to escape from the endosomes, allowed the phage to escape from the endosome, the endosomes and increase gene delivery in vitro as well as in vivo here in tumors compared to the phage that has, diff that has low ability to escape from the endosomes. Then we try to increase transport to the nucleus of the phage. We displayed NLS, nuclear localization signal. It didn't work. But then what we did, we combined the phage with low dose of doxorubicin, which is a therapeutic drug, because doxorubicin induces cell cycle arrest in G2 M phase, during which the, the, the nuclear membranes are opened. So then we had better accumulation of the phage in the nucleus. 
What we also did, we used transcriptional targeting. Instead of using the same V promoter, we replaced that promoter with tumor specific promoters, like this one of the glucose regulated protein. Why? Because this promoter is highly active in brain tumors, including glioblastoma. And because the gene, GRP78, is associated with glioblastoma resistant to timozolomide, which is the chemotherapeutic drug used in the clinic. And if you take glioblastoma from patients that were treated with timozolomide, they have high expression of this gene. So when we generated this phase with GRP78 promoter, if you, if you add this to human glioblastoma cells, you give them low dose of timozolomide, you increase gene delivery. Why is that? Because when you give them timozolomide, a human glioma cells, they try to resist by activating the gene. But what they don't know is that at the same time, they activate the promoter from our phase. That's what they do. So then we decided to treat a human glioblastoma. These are deadly brain tumors, as you can see here by the MRI. This is a primary tumor, they diffuse. We decided to treat them because the majority of patients, they die within, 60, within six months, actually. More than, more than 50%, they die within six months, 70% within one year, 90% they die within three years, and 99% they die within five years. Everybody dies. That's why I decided to treat them. And because they express the receptor of our phage, alpha beta integrins, because our phage can be, delivered, can be delivered systemically, which is non-invasive, because initially when they treated this in, in the clinic with gene therapy, they had to repeat the local injections, which are invasive. And these tumors are diffusing, they diffuse. So you cannot treat locally, you need a systemic administration. And a major limitation, major challenge in treating these tumors or, neuro or delivering to the brain is the blood brain barrier. And our face can cross a blood brain barrier, actually. We were, we, were, we were lucky. And this was actually described, the ability of face to cross the blood brain barrier was described as early as 1943. No one was born at that time, 1943, because Dobos, what he tried to do, he treated meningitis. He used the facial meningitis, bacterial infections in the brain. Like this is a, a paper he published at the time when he injected the phage intraperitoneal to mice, he found high level of the phage in the brain. And then he treated meningitis in the mice as soon as the bacteria was destroyed by the phage then you see a sharp drop. Then later other groups showed that the M13 phage we use to make our vectors, if you inject this phage IP or intravenous, you find the phage in the brain. And this is the brain blood ratio of the phage. There was more phage in the brain than actually in the blood. So it means the phage crossed the blood brain barrier. That's why we, we decide to use it to treat brain tumors. So what we do, we take, we take human tumors, we implant them, I'm just going to show the example of glioblastoma. We are treating medulloblastoma, pediatric brain tumors. But so we implant them in the brain. We do sections of the brain. You see the tumor, the, the brain to look at the, the, uh, the, uh, the receptor to make sure that the receptor, alpha v beta 3 integral receptor is in the tumors, but is not expressed in the healthy brain. Then we inject our phage IV through the tail vein. When we make sections, what you see in red are the blood vessels, the brain, the tumor. So the green is the phage. So there is a selective accumulation of the phage in the tumor in the brain, but not in the healthy tissue. It means it crosses the blood brain barrier. And then if you use a vector that delivers suicide gene therapy, the herpes simplex virus amidine kinase, you give me cyclovir. If your vector is not targeted, what happens? Look at the tumors, they grow so large because the phase cannot accumulate in the tumors because there is no RGD. But if you deliver the targeted vector, you give them cyclovir, and then you destroy these tumors. And then you compare to timozolomide, which is the chemotherapeutic drug used in the clinic, it's a similar effect. But when we combine low-dose timozolomide with the vector to activate the promoter to increase the production of TK and the carrier of these tumors, we, we achieved a massive destruction 
of these tumors. And we even some of the tumors, I'm not showing these data, were actually from children, 10 year old ch child who died actually because of a glioblastoma, it was a horrible tumor. We could save actually when we implanted them in mice, we could cure 25% of mice. Actually, which is which is impressive. They were talking about glioblastoma. Now, in in the in the in the in the remaining slides, I'm going to show you the second generation, the breakthrough that we have achieved. Was this breakthrough? If you look at the at the first generation of vector, the the the, the capsid of our bacteriophage packages or hybrid genome of phage in green and the AV in yellow. In the therapeutic particles, we don't need the genome of bacteriophage, so they, we decided to get rid of it. But how do you do that? Because you need to replicate your AAV in bacteria, because there is no AAV genome to, to do that. So we, we just inserted an origin of, of replication of phage in AAV genome to allow the AAV, the human genome virus, to replicate in bacteria and to get packaged. Then we start to replicate AAV in bacteria. But there is no AAV, there is no phase genome. It means there is no capsid. So then we infect with the helper phase to provide the capsid, and we manage to produce these small particles. But the advantage was that these small particles show dramatic increase in gene delivery. And, and, and that we didn't know about that until lately. That's why we rushed to publish this. It was accepted last week in Imbu Molecular Medicine when we were trying to publish in, in big journals and we didn't want to spend another year fighting with nature and all these journals because some groups at MIT, they found that this phase, when they, they decrease the size of M13, it gets better in distribution, even it, it gets better into the brain. It, even it gets better in crossing the blood-brain barrier. So I rushed, we rushed actually in, in publishing, and now it's accepted in immunomolecular medicine. If you look at the size, that's the large phage we used in the past, which doesn't belong to us anymore. But then we have these small particles, which are half size. Half size. Then we decided to treat some difficult brain tumors. These are, these are brain tumors from patients. They are rich in stem cells, because stem cells from glioma, they, they are resistant to treatment. That's what causes recurrence and death. That's why they come back, the tumors. They come back and, and they cause death of patients. And the, the large particles were ineffective in delivering uh, nucleic acid expression, Why the small particles here in green were able, were quite effective at delivering genes in, into all these uh, tumors. The brain tumors from patients. These are stem cells from glioma, and these are spheres of, of tumor stem cells, tumor cells such in vitro. You see the, 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 the large particle and use the minimal delivery of nucleic acid compared to the small particles. And then why is that actually? Because we, we looked at the diffusion. The large particle have difficult to diffuse to reach the cells. You see the diffusion, five minutes, 30 minutes, no changes. But the small particles at five minutes, they had better diffusion. And at 30 minutes, they completely diffused out. They can diffuse rapidly to find the cells. Even if you put them on a matri gel, they cross the matri gel and you can recover them from, from the other, from you put them on the upper compartment, then they can cross the matri gel, you find you recover them from the lower compartment. If you look at the entry, the large particles in red, that's the entry at uh, two hours, four hours, there is no, there is no improvement, while the, the, the small particles have better entry over time. And then when we looked inside the cells, if you look at the large particles in red, they were split. They had equal distribution between the cytoplasm and the, the nucleus, while the small particles, the majority of the small particles were localized in, in the nucleus, so there is a better transport to the nucleus. So now we'll show some application, uh, the time, still the time they have the application of these small particles because they are small, so they have increased cloning capacity. So we could fit in CRISPR-Cas9 because CRISPR-Cas9 is a 10 KB, it's a large construct. So we could clone this and deliver Cas9 expression to human lung carcinoma 
resulting in deletion of the P53, the mutant P53. Mutation of P53 is actually associated with many types of cancer. Now we are performing in vivo studies. So then we also apply the immunotherapy and cancer immunotherapy. These are the five classes of cancer immunotherapy. Immunotherapy uses monoclonal antibodies, CAR T cell therapy, immune checkpoint inhibitors, cancer vaccine and cytokines. I will just show you examples of cytokines and cancer vaccines. We deliver the TNF alpha, TNF alpha using these small particles. So TNF alpha has a problem of secretion because it's a transmembrane protein and it depends on the expression of an enzyme by tumor cells to cut the, the extracellular domain to release it into, into the extracellular matrix to, to cause cell death. So what we, what we did, we redesigned the TNF alpha. We just fused TNF alpha to the signal peptide of interleukin 2 to generate a secreted TNF alpha, as you can see here. If you add the small particles, you generate high secretion of TNF alpha here compared to the native transmembrane TNF alpha. So when we inject this into mice with tumors, here, this is an intravenous administration of the small particles. Then we, we, we screened the tumors and the tissues for the expression of TNF alpha into these mice. And we detected high levels of TNF alpha expression in the tumors, but not in the, in the healthy tissue. And then, and then after 18 days, you see that the targeted treatment uh, caused suppression of these tumors compared to the controls, non-targeted group, in which the tumors grow very large. And this is the tumor viability. The tumor viability was completely suppressed by the targeted intravenous administration of the vector compared to controls. This is just again TNF alpha in human chondrosarcoma. You see the tumors, they, they, we had regression of the tumors completely destroyed. We completely lost the viability because the vector delivered TNF alpha to these tumors while they grow very large in controls. Now I will finish with interleukin 15 and, and vaccine. Why interleukin 15? It's a cytokine, it's in clinical trials. It is showing some positive results against metastatic cancer. But the problem is with the protein because they keep injecting patients with the protein. And this interleukin-15 protein has problems of uh, short half-life, rapid clearance, toxicity, because they have to repeat the administration. So we got some funding from CRUP to deliver as gene, to deliver gene of interleukin-15. And then we, we, we injected mice with tumors with increasing doses here. You can see high doses here of the small particles delivered in TNF alpha. And all these doses generated selective expression of interleukin-15, sorry, not TNF alpha, interleukin-15 in the tumors, but not in the healthy tissues. And the non-targeted vector without RGD did not generate any interleukin-15 expression in the tumors. And there was no toxicity because the levels of LDH, lactate dehydrogenase, were normal. And the cancer immunotherapy with interleukin-15 was quite impressive. Actually, treatment with a targeted vector uh, resulted in complete suppression of the tumors as early as day five, as you can see from day zero to day five, compared to tumors in control from day zero to day five, in which they grew very large. Even we managed to cure 50% of the mice. 50% of the mice were tumor-free for more than one year. They could, we just stopped the experiment, they could still be alive. I will finish with the, the vaccine. Why is that, cancer vaccine, why? Because the phage has been used as a vector to deliver vaccines, because it can carry antigens on the cell surface using the phage display technology. Because phage gets uptaken by the antigen-presenting cells. Because phage interacts both with measures of compatibility class one and class two. And because it contains, it contains methylated CPG motifs, which are immunostimulant. 
And in 2018, we published this with the first generation of our vector, that the ability of the vector to cross the antistinal barrier, it can be given as oral vaccine. The phase our vectors can be given as oral vaccine because they can resist to the harsh environment of the gastro, gastrointestinal tract and they can cross the intestinal barrier. So just with cancer vaccines, we use it, we, are, we have data now with the COVID vaccine, but I will just show you this story we completed cancer vaccines. Cancer vaccines is actually the injections of vaccines to patients that will induce an immune response against the tumor antigens, tumor associated antigens or tumor specific antigens. But the problem is that tumor associated antigens, you find them in other tissues, tumor specific antigens, they get down regulated over time by the tumors. So what we decided to do is to deliver a foreign antigen, for example, for example, a viral antigen, as long as this, uh, this, uh, the vaccine against the antigen induces an immune response against the tumor. That's what we do. For example, we use a malaria vaccine. We vaccinate the mice. When the malaria vaccine induces an immune response, here what we do, we establish tumors in mice. So these mice have a tumor and they have a vaccine against malaria. So we take the phage, we inject IV with the aim that the phage delivers the antigen in the tumors. So then the vaccine will see the, the tumors as a malaria, so it attacks it. Yeah, attacks it. So for instance, if you take splenocytes, some of the vaccinated mice, you mix them with tumor cells, nothing happens. But if you take the tumor cells, you treat them with the phage to deliver the antigen, and you mix them with splenocytes, then splenocytes, they destroy tumor cells because of the antigen. The same thing in mice. The tumors in vaccinated mice, they grow very large. But if you inject the phage IV, the phage will deliver the antigen into the tumors. Then the vaccine, the immune response induced by the vaccine will attack the tumors. The idea in the future, when patients develop cancer, we will look what they are vaccinated against. If they are vaccinated against COVID, we deliver the spike protein into the tumors to induce a, an attack against, against cancer. So to conclude, that's we have, what we have done since 2009. So that's the phase we used in 2009 to treat the dogs. That's the efficacy of delivery. And then over the years, what we did, we uncovered the limitations and we improved these particles. Now we have particles that can, with, with thousands, thousands fold uh, better, better efficacy than the original particles. This table shows the, the challenges of gene delivery, and you can see our, our bacteriophage viruses, they, they, they have some potential advantages over mammalian viruses. They are cheaper, they are targetable, they have larger cloning capacity, we can repeat the administrations and other, and uh, the, the, they don't need cold, ch cold chain transport. They are, you can just transport them at, at room temperature and you can scale up the production. The second generation that we have now, we, we open, we, is, is already taken, licensed by, by a company, a startup company with the MIT, with an MIT team in which I am a scientific co-founder. And uh, the first generation is starting clinical trials already, but we are pushing for, uh, for the small particles. We're working now on clinical trials, especially in, in pediatric brain tumors. Hopefully we to start as soon as possible in 2023. And I would like to, to thank the team, to thank the team, the PhD students, the postdoc and, and, and the funders. And thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. I mean, that was a fascinating talk. I learned so much from a really, really exciting technology. Thank you. Um, so I think the first question that I want, I had this on my mind, but it's also coming up from the, the audience box is um, digging in a little bit into that kind of ability to cross barriers. Because I was really surprised to hear how well it crosses the blood brain barrier that you're saying like the, the intestinal barriers as well. So is there any mechanistic understanding of how it's able to get across this thing that has been the bane of so many gene therapists life for so long? We still don't know. Uh, the paper published in PNAS 2002 that group from, from Tel Aviv University in Israel, who showed that the M13 phase, the, the one we use to make our vector, 
they, 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 in the discussion, they, they believe it's because of the filament is, the filament is morphology of the page, because when they change, they try to change the morphology of the in 13 phase. And then the, the ability of crossing blood brain barrier was reduced. But my question is that why other groups of phase, which are not filamentous, can also cause a blood brain barrier? I think, and that group, there's a group of the MIT, that's why we were competing with them. That's why we rushed to publish the paper. What they show, I mean, I hear they, when they reduce the size of M13 phase, they found a better crossing of the BBB, of the, of, of the BBB, that's, yeah. So it could be the size, it could be, it was a combination. So the filament is, and, and because I didn't show data with the small particles when we treat pediatric medulloblastoma, the data are quite impressive, actually. The, the accumulation in, in the tumors. Oh, that's so cool. And, and it's kind of an interesting thing. And I'm wondering if you could comment on the, kind of the size comparison to uh, something like AAV, which is known as being a very small vector, but does not really efficiently cross the blood brain barrier. So is it like that it's just even that much smaller than AAV itself? Or as you say, is it something to do with kind of this, you know, multimodal way of getting across the blood brain barrier? Uh, one AAV is serotype. I think AAV, because AAV has various serotypes, mm -hmm. serotype 9 can cross a blood brain barrier. Yeah, but poorly, right? And then they develop. Because EV the, the thing like is that, that they, can, they cannot give it systemically. That's why that's a very good point when you say poorly, because if they give it through in the arm, uh, intravenous infusion, they lose a lot in the liver. Yes. And other <laughs> very, very little gets into the brain. That's it. That's why what they do. What they do, they inject into the neck, they mm -hmm. inject into the jugular vein, then to avoid, so they don't lose it elsewhere. That's why it's poor. I think it can uh, serotype nine, serotype nine, because I mean the difference we haven't compared to see which one is actually uh, better at crossing yeah. blood uh, brain barrier. The, the only thing with our observation is that if there is no receptor, because the phase gets cleared by the reticular endothelial system. And in the brain by, by the microglia, if there is no receptor, it will get cleared. It mm -hmm. will get cleared. But if there is a receptor, you, you trap the phase, then you see it everywhere. It's a massive accumulation. It's yes. massive accumulation. Excellent. Thank you. And we've got another question from the audience that's just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on why genome reduction of phages increases the efficacy of delivery. Yeah, I mean, as I said, the, I mean, the, the diffusion mm -hmm. first. With the, with the large particles, we published that with my, that was actually a PC student paper, three months we published it. It's interesting that paper in molecular cancer, which is 20 impact factor. It's interesting <laughs> because with the what we observed with the large particles, when you add to tumor cells, which have rich extraordinary cellular matrix, then it has difficult to diffuse, to diffuse. And so you reduce, you add collagenase, Days, then you reduce the concentration of the extracellular matrix, then there is better diffusion and better delivery. But the small particles, they don't have this problem. They diffuse better. Is it because of the reduced size? They diffuse better. We tried the, the various tests and they diffuse better. And then there is better entry. There is better entry. We know that, we know that the smaller they are, the better because they, I mean, when they get, because they get into these vesicles, the endosomes, because they are smaller, maybe more particles get into the endosomes mm -hmm. with half size. Like if we have 20 of large particles, maybe we have 40, 40 mm -hmm. of the other ones. So th then that's why we have more particles getting, getting into the endosome. And nuclear transport, that, that's the thing. We have more, we find more genome, more genome. Th that's an important question. One of you were actually, uh, ask that question. That's we are addressing this in the discussion. The reviewer is asking why there is better accumulation of the genome in the nucleus when you do when you treat with the small particles, because the small particles have only AAV. They only yeah. deliver the AAV yes. genome, which is a human virus, yes. which has evolved to find its way to the nucleus, the genome. 
But that's what the capsid of AAV, they deliver AAV in the site where they don't know whether the whole capsid gets into the nucleus. So the genome gets in. While the other one, the, the large particles, they have a hybrid genome, phase yeah. genome and AAV genome. So when the hybrid genome is delivered, the phase genome is a burden actually for the AAV. Yeah. That's, the, that's what you we actually, are addressing. Yeah. You anticipated my next question because I was wondering if you played with that at all. Because it had struck me that you'd basically taken away all the phage stuff, all the stuff that's used to you know, transducing prokaryotes. Um, and if you basically just tried to make an AAV genome as big as the original phage genome was to see if it was strictly a size difference or if it was getting rid of the phage DNA as well. So, so far in that publication, when we, when we, when we cloned the CRISPR-Cas9, mm -hmm. which is 10 KB, the whole genome was like 13 KB. So yeah. the, the AAV capsid cannot accommodate more than four and a half. Yeah. Yeah. But with the phage capsid so far, we are reaching 18 kb, 18, we, because the phase stretches. What happens when the phase is produced, the coat proteins of the phase, they get localized on the membrane of the bacteria. Yeah. And then the, the genome, the AAV gets packaged, and it's not released until the whole genome is packaged. Mm -hmm. packaged. That's why you say it's stretched. So uh, that's we, so far we could deliver 18, 20 kb of AAV. Is that the question? Is that your question? Well, I was I, I very actually, I had that question down as well, but I was wondering if you had compared using very large AAV only phages to your standard size of phage AAV hybrid to see if it was just uh, the difference in size. With, the no, we haven't done that. To compare yeah. AAV, no, we haven't. Because the thing is that we can only do it in vitro because our vectors are systemic. You deliver mm -hmm. everything systemically. You take AAV, like I showed with adenoviral vector, you deliver systemically, everything is in the liver. Yeah. And then that's the thing. You can deliver them system. The only thing we can deliver local, we can just yes. inject into the tumors local, see what happens, or treat cells in vitro. We haven't done that, actually. We haven't done that. Okay. Um, so I think we'll wrap it up there as we're just getting to the end of time. Um, but I just want to thank you so much for a really, really impressive talk. I was really thrilled to so much the data. We could have probably done an hour long conversation just afterwards. Um, a recording of this webinar, just for everybody's uh, interest, is going to be put up on the YouTube channel very soon. And you should be able to find a link in the chat function. Um, so thank you very much, Professor Hajito. It was great talking to you. Um, everybody, I hope you had a great time and learned as much as I did. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.